And going along that line, um, the old Bill Schultz uh, thing, the paddle ball book, the old articles, uh, and you said it yourself, in order to get better at racquetball, you have to do what? Well, there's a number of things. What Schultz said, let's talk about the, the things that I'm going to discard about what Schultz said. Okay. Schultz and Muleheisen both hold that at whatever the height is of the ball, that's where you should hit on the wall. So if the ball is, is waist height, you drive the ball waist height. If the ball, if you want to kill the ball, you have to hit it off of your, your shoelace in order to be consistent. Right. Well, I know is God eats green apples is that's bullshit because I hit the ball right. regularly right. from above my waist and I hit the hammer down right. in the corner and it's adios right. and Right, I, I, I teach it at my camps. I, Billy Goldstein, one of my first mentors at the Jewish community said, Winterton, you gotta get down low. So I get down real low, I'm still lifting the ball up. I go to my first tournament and I watch a guy take a ball up here and roll it. So I said, now wait a minute. There's something that <laughs> it has to do with more than the height you hit the ball. It does, and also the, the reason why I've discovered this, and it's so plain to me, that the so-called fundamental doesn't exist, or right. there's a different meaning of the word fundamental, right. is that from the handball, as we discussed, I take it wherever it is. So when this ball's here, and I've got the guy in my hip, it's time to strike. If I back up with that ball and let it go down to my right. shoelace, he's this guy the, is in the middle of the position. court smoking big cigars. Right. So I hit down. Right. And what happens is total pandemonium right. on the part of my opponent. Right. And I'm sure that if you looked and you charted Kane's serve returns of, say, garbage serves, that he's hitting a lot of balls head high right. down into the corner for winners. Right. Hogan hit him. Hogan was the only player I ever saw that could hit effectively with power higher than even Kane can. And he came down from the heavens with that ball. And if you went up to Marty Hogan and said, you know, Marty, you didn't wait for that ball to get to your shoelaces, <laughs> he'd just look at you. Yeah. Okay? So why would I teach that as a fundamental? Right. Right. It, to me, it's about making the offensive area bigger depending upon the player you're working with. For example, I'm working on my master's degree. It's 1978. I can't work out. I have no time. I'm working. I'm coaching football. I'm, I'm working at school. And I want to keep something in my game so I'm playing a tournament. And I'm going into tournaments unprepared. I'm going to my tournaments for my workout. But I looked at it as if my offensive area had shrunk. And I had a smaller offensive area. I used center court in an imaginary circle. If I got my shot in that area, I was taking it. The rest of the time, I was playing defense. That's the module method. Yeah, and, and it worked. I mean, I really played, plus because I had no expectations on myself. If you do, do no more, if you never do something you can't do on the court, and you have one or two effective modules, you're going to play double A ball. It's the person, and you ask how can you improve if you're not going to do uh, other stuff and you're always going to be defensive in this large uh -huh. swath of the court. You do them one at a time. You never give up a point saying I'm practicing a shot. I've never given up a point to anybody, including you yesterday. I don't give up points. The single most important thing to a student is to realize that when you step into the arena of competition, you give up nothing. You don't give up inches. You don't give up feet. You don't give up court position. You strike when the iron's hot, and you never, ever give a free point away for any reason. That sends a message that's undeniable to your opponent. And for someone to score 21 points against my defense and against my module offense, that is a formidable task that only the greatest players could possibly crack. Right. But you can't, you can't go in and play practice. Practice by yourself. That's where you can practice. And even then you're holding yourself to the highest standards. 
Now, what I used to do, and I don't recommend this for many, but when I would play to get ready for the Nationals, when I'm practicing against somebody and playing, I would take those critical shots, and if I missed, I instructed my opponent to hit me as hard as he could in the back. And what I was trying to do was to create a climate where there was a tremendous amount of pressure on me when I was striking the ball, so that there was whatever I could figure out with my feet, my body, my mind, my whatever it was, having my, so I wouldn't miss that shot and get hit in the back. When I got to the tournament, I wasn't at all feeling under pressure compared to what I was in practice. Right, practice has to be harder than that. And I created tournament. an atmosphere that allowed me to prosper as a competitive player so early with no tournament experience. These kids now, they've played 30 tournaments. I was almost through my career by the time they're ready to play a first real tournament. <laughs> I had to be ready now, right. and I had to practice that way. Okay, so you're pr when you practice by yourself, all right, you mentioned you have the guy hitching in the back. That, that, how about uh, what other methods would you use to simulate tournament conditions in practice? Well, when I first was practicing a stroke, I didn't hold myself to the highest of, of uh, horror, so to speak. When I hit, let's say when I started working on the ceiling ball, I would hit it, and at first I could only hit three ceiling balls that wouldn't catch the side wall. That's unsatisfactory. But after each session of a thousand, I would chart what was the most I was able to hit that I assessed would be non killable. Did you make notes yes. as to what you had to do to adjust? Yes, and I would have general notes of what what needed to be done, what worked satisfactorily, every aspect. And when of, you hit the ceiling ball, you cut it. When I hit the ceiling ball, you couldn't cut it and get it deep enough. Yeah, because of the flat. ball. So yeah. what I had was a full arm ceiling ball like this, and I turned away from the ball and swept it up to the ceiling, and I could hit that, because I hit it a thousand times, I could hit that effortlessly right. for hours, and the other person right. who's hitting it square to the left wall is trying to muscle it up, and right. they're dead tired in the first game. Right, and you just did what most people do. Your arm is separating from your body, yeah. which wears you out there and yeah. eventually wears you down. And as opposed to, I say, keeping your hitting wrist behind your back shoulder as much as possible. Today's game, with the ball faster, I'm, I'm having a... You like, have to feather touch that. Yeah, yeah, and man. it's like Haber used to do to the ceiling in handball. He could take it and he would feather it down the left wall and it would arrive at the back. By the way, track. you know, the people watching this may not know who Paul Haber was. Paul Haber. He's passed away. You can that. take every athlete you've ever seen and every award they've ever won and throw it in the trash can. That guy was the best competitor I have ever seen in my life. He was a five-time handball champion and a piece of hard bark. That's that, the way I describe that it. That YouTube footage, I think it exists out there today, if, if you get a chance, you got to go look it up if you're watching this. That that tiebreaker against uh, Dr. Bud in Memphis, the what he did, I, I couldn't believe what I was watching. Yeah, hands versus racket. He's playing against a guy hitting with a racket on the handball. It, it, the guy's incredible. I, I was at that match, and so was Sports Illustrated. It was the best physical activity sporting event I ever witnessed. Yeah. All right, come back to the come back to the practicing serve now. Tom Travers, who's a current uh, coach and the guy that influenced my teaching quite a bit, has a saying: If you're not afraid to serve, whoever you're playing, if your opponent's not afraid of your serve, you don't have a complete game. So he came up with a way that I think is easier to chart serves. Uh, groups of 10. So if you're, have, if you're practicing the serve, rather than hitting a thousand shots or buckets of balls or working until you get it perfect or whatever, now you got something to measure. You have a percentage. So if you hit 10 serves and you, at first, if you start charting serves, any, almost everybody I ever work with, from pros to B and C players, they start hitting serves, it's going to be ugly at first. It's going to be 20%, 30% in. But eventually, when you get up to 70% or 
or a higher of getting the serve just over the line uh, to the left and to the right, then what's going to happen when you get in the tournament, you are not going to fall. And it makes no difference whether you're playing one serve or two serves. Now, the old pro game, when it was one serve, nobody was drive serving. And I couldn't figure out why nobody was drive serving. You know, when I was 56 years old, I played a pro tournament and went five games with the number one seed only because he wouldn't drive serve. He was afraid mm -hmm. of faulting. Mm -hmm. So if you chart your serves and you hit, you hit tennis pros, and tennis, they hit 100 serves three times a week or more, and I want my athletes doing the same. Would you agree with that? I would to a certain extent. I First of all, I myself have never seen anyone practice their serve other than by playing. Really? Ever. Yeah, well, and it's embarrassing mind. to say that, but I've never seen a teacher go out and are by themselves. They may have a teacher on the court and telling them to serve, but I've never seen anyone in there hitting it like 500 serves. Just I haven't seen it. It yeah. may exist, but it has. I've never seen anyone have a service book, right? Where they and it's more important than just how to serve. You need to know what you're going to get back from the specific serve that the you serve. The options of the return and that you're going to get. I'll tell you, in my paddle ball, everyone in the country, the top players in the country, lob every serve. Really? I lob zero serves in singles. I drive every single serve. And the reason I do is because I, I, the kind of ball I want to get back is dictated by my serve. I don't want to get a ball over my head or high. I don't want to give a good athlete three seconds to figure out what he's going to do with this floater coming back to him. Right. I want to use my advantage, which is quick thinking. I want him to have to think quick and me to have to think quick, and I'll take my chances on that comparison. So how do you relocate out of the box? Is how do I? Yeah, or you just move back. You don't think about... You mean in the box itself? Yeah, after you hit the serve. Well, it's again the predator. If I sense the fish wriggling, I'm not relocating anywhere. If I can get the fish to wriggle, I am plucking it out of the water forthwith. I step in, and I wherever it is, I hit it. Wherever it is, if I have to jump up, I hit it. And... Uh, with regard to uh, backing out of the serve, service zone, it's very poorly done at the amateur level. My, my goal all the time in a standard serve where I haven't gained a huge advantage and I don't sense the fish wriggling, I try to turn and get as deep as I can before the swing starts into the ball. As it commences to start, I turn and I'm running straight in to the court at pretty damn close to full speed, preparing to break to the right. And the reason I'm preparing to break, I serve mostly to the left side, unless I'm playing a super lefty. And I know from experience that 75% of all balls go across court. It's going to be hard to get court. the ball down the left wall. It ain't right going down the line. If right. you take this, I'll take the pro, go watch the pros and have them returning the serve. Now we're talking paddle ball or racquetball? Either one. And you take anybody on that four wall court that has, that has facing any kind of a serve other than an absolute setup, I'll bet you that more than 75% of the balls do one of three things. Go down the line and come off the back wall where you don't need to be running around, you just walk back and kill it. Number two, splat over to the forehand side, or number three, or hit cross court in an attempt to drive it for a winner. Now, that's a huge percentage. Now, what do I do to make that percentage higher? Because that's what I want. I want someone to hit to my forehand from serve return. What I do is, when I make that move in, as the swing is actually occurring, they see me burst in toward the left. What is their natural inclination to do? It's to hit away from me. To go right. And that changes 75 to 85. 
So I break off that play as soon as I am sure the ball's not going down the line and I'm already there to finish before the fish can come into play. I prefer to score when there's no one there. I don't prefer to score when I have to roll the ball out with somebody in center court. That's only an idiotic way of playing in comparison. Now, we understand that there are ways where you can't do that because the players are just too good. They're, they can kill the ball too soon, so you can't afford to wait. I'm putting that issue aside for the time being. I move in and I antip anticipate the opposite. So if I'm charging, I anticipate a pass. So if they drive the ball at me, I go like this. It's not Marty Hogan or Kane. It just went for a winner over there because you're still back here. I'm anticipating the opposite. Just like if I were charging a bunt, would I be going into the bunt like this? Well, if I don't like my teeth, I would. But you have to anticipate the drive. So when you come in for a bunt, you're ready to do this. That's what I do better than anybody, or at least did in my heyday. And that's what people don't do. They decide, they're told by, a, by somebody, hey, look, you got to cover the front court. They're coming in on the ball as if they're covering the front court, but they're not thinking the opposite. Right, so a floater passed. could hit him in the chest. Right. Rather than be a setup, it right. becomes a terminal event right. for the rally. Right. Sorry, I feel strongly about this one, this no, one no, aspect of the game. No, it's, uh, the problem, again, going, going back to racquetball today and watching all these matches, um, first, I think, and you can speak to this, there are points in the match where the tempo should be changed. And in the old days, there was a lot of tempo changing. You know, like fast break basketball and half court basketball. If you take 10 mm -hmm. seconds between each serve, that's a long time. And you slow the game down and you string the game out and you make it very long. And if you have to go up against a power player and you can make the game long, power players don't like that. They want to get in and get going. The game needs to be learned first and foremost in accordance with the mental framework of the student. So if you have uh, an accountant type right. person, right. you don't teach the same as if you have a fighter pilot type person. Right. So the first thing you need to assess right. when you're teaching is what is the personality right. of my student? Right. That's the first thing you need to assess when you're playing an opponent. What is the type of person that, that I'm, I'm playing? playing? What does that type of person want? Right. What does that person type of person dislike? Right. What are the ways I can bring my talents to bear to make it uncomfortable right. for them within the rules? Very little discussion of that in any camps I've gone to. But that's what I lived on. I lived yeah, on okay. making that opponent uncomfortable because all of, any competent star player can kill the ball when they're comfortable. A champion can kill the ball when they're uncomfortable. Right. But you're not facing champions every day. Right. You have to be able to win, and those matches are critical. It's just like in practice. If I have a guy that I can dispense with by utilizing techniques that are within the rules but make them uncomfortable, I save energy for the finals. Right. If I don't play in accordance with that general rule, which is to attack the personality of my opponent, I am losing points. I am losing percentages. I am losing championships that I could have won. All right. So when you, but when you meet the person who is of equal caliber, or, or, well, that of course, as great as you are, you never met anybody equal caliber. But in practice, I never <laughs> played anyone of equal talent. No, but so I'm talking about the game tempo. Okay. Uh, let, Let's let talk about game tempo. Let, let me put it to you a different way. I am watching matches that I sense there are opportunities to speed the game up or slow the game down, which will be to the advantage of 
my athlete. Uh, and I'm having to explain it to them. They uh, don't sense it. And it used to be, and Drew Koshnick, who himself was a national pro champion, Drew said he believes because of the smaller rackets, you people grew up having to be comfortable changing tempo and using more tricks and angles and everything. And, to, and with the bigger rackets, people just grew up hitting the ball. All right, and that's to me a fair statement, and I don't believe it's, I, I think it's a criticism of the modern game, but I'll point out this thing. I've always felt that the, the sport is best where all different ingredients of a person can be utilized at one time or another to change the outcome of a point or a match. Right. The modern game is more of a technical exhibition so that heart conditioning, psychological ploys, they all take a distant back seat to the ability to strike the ball. In the old days, the players weren't as accomplished, be it due to them or the equipment or both. And there was much more brought to bear, and we're talking about the, the movement of the pace of play. The primary reason I changed pace of play is because of fatigue. The old game was, let's just put it this way, it was brutal. And in my experience was until 1975 or so, probably 60% of matches were uh, in the championship finals were decided based on injury or uh, cramping. It was a very high percentage where a player was limping noticeably oh, yeah. and it was just a, it was a bitch to finish a tournament in those days, particularly if you're going two events, two out of three to 21. Oh, yeah. It was bad. Too much probably for normal people to enjoy. So I would consistently serve balls into the gallery and yeah, refuse to play with new ones until they could be found. and. They would be kicking of the ball and people, they still do this diving on the floor and stopping play for 10 minutes while they sponge it off. The, I don't like to do that, but that's part of the game. The, the Getting the, injured and disappearing for 20 minutes. Well, so. that was a legitimate injury. <laughs> that's a bad rep. But what, what happened was everybody knows that if, if, if you're a type A personality, you want something to happen now. Right. I want something to happen now. I hate people slow playing the serve. I dislike it completely. And so by the time they serve it, you know what Jay Jones would do, speaking of servers? He would watch me, and I had longish hair then, and I would be sweating profusely because of the effort I was putting out. And he would watch me until a drop of sweat hit my glass lens and he would serve. <laughs> he would go over and take a time out <laughs> and put his back against the side wall and serve into the wet spot. <laughs> there was just a whole rigmarole in those days of these little carnival tricks on how to get a little bit of edge. Did look you... at your opponent's feet and when they look down. Yeah, so... I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff. now. Coaches know, because you're away from the fray, the, the, the participant doesn't want to look like a wussy and be slowing stuff down or calling right. timeouts. That's why a coach exists in baseball, for instance. When they see the pitcher getting jittery, they come out. They don't come out because they need to tell the guy how to pitch. He right. already knows how to pitch. They come out to chit-chat with him, really? let him relax a little bit, so that he can play like he normally plays. That's the right. goal. Sometimes right. it works, sometimes it doesn't. Right. Carl Loveday, my coach, came out one time in this critical match, and he walks on the court and he goes, well, babe, he's uh, serving the ball real good against you. Um, uh, uh, your 30 seconds is up. And he walked <laughs> off the court. He wasn't able to articulate a single deal, but it calmed me down because there'd been a break and I could relax and catch my wits about me. And I think it's important for players to do that. But there's so many breaks now. I mean, when I watch the modern game, the rallies are extraordinarily truncated in most instances 
and there's always an argument after each point where they go to the linesman and, and there's a lot of breaks. So I would think that if there's going to be any instance of changing tempo, it would be to speed it up, not slow it down. Am I wrong in that? Well, my, to my way of thinking, there's times for both to do both, and both will be effective. Oftentimes when you hit that wall of not being able to score points, uh, you hit that stalemate, and I see it a lot, especially with focus really high. You know, there's great serves and great returns, and it stays the same, and it becomes a war of wills at that point. Whoever changes the serve, changes the tempo, comes out. I like to call it pressure points. And to me, I remember years ago, these coaches that I'd work with, I got great stats. They're showing me the stats of how many points were won here and how many points were won there. And so you look at it and all these X's is unforced error or forced errors on the backhand side. Well, they're playing Egan in a way who hits the ball 100 and 60 miles an hour, so the stats are misleading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stats don't mean as much to me as, as where does the player hate to have the ball? In, in what, and so when I'm, people always ask me, what are you writing? Of course, I don't like to tell them, but, and I write in a way that no one will ever be able to read my writing, but I'm making notes to myself, and I'm making notes what's going to work during, what to say during the timeout. Most of the time, what you say in a timeout can only screw a player up, so you've got to be very careful. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, so, let me give you, and I'm going to share a secret with you, with you on camera. If I, you're playing and down the line, uh, you need to hit more down the lines. There's about three different ways of saying it. The first way is to say you need to hit more down the lines which puts a negative thought into your head immediately, I'm not hitting down the line. Second way of, the second way of saying it is uh, down the line's open. That's a little better because that puts a positive thought in your mind. But here's the best way of saying it. When you hit that down the line, that was awesome. You didn't have a prayer. Mm -hmm. That's all you got to say. Now, I just, I just said so. even if you didn't hit down the line, you might go out and go, when did I hit it down the line? You didn't. You know, I remember Alvaro one time, I said, that was a great idea, calling that timeout. He thinks you're exhausted. And after the match, Alvaro goes, I didn't do it because of that. I was exhausted. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> right? Right. Because you're, you're putting, the people that you're working with are elite athletes. And I mean, and I don't just mean the pros. I'm talking juniors. If you go to the Nationals, you're an elite athlete. Just entering means Correct. you got some big ones. You're putting it out there. So you want to succeed, and the worst thing that a coach can do is put more pressure on you. I'm always, I, I want my players not to be afraid to make a shot and never lose because they got tight. Uh, and, and when they do lose, it's my fault. I did... I didn't coach you up well enough, you know. Well, one thing, thing for certain is in the modern game, if you're not feeling prepared to shoot the ball, you're at a severe disadvantage. Yeah. So anything that the coach can do in preparation or whatever needs to be done to make the player. I do, uh, with some of my students, I do blue line drills, which is I want that ball to hit exactly at the crack. Every shot they hit goes directly at the crack. Maybe 50, 60, you 80, You mean 100. on the left wall or right wall? Like right, no, right in, the, right in the front. Flat out, oh, straight oh, oh, ahead oh. rollouts. Not two inches up, right. not four inches up, right Aren't in the Aren't you contradicting what you said earlier? No, about I want to be able to do it. If I have to do it, I just never have to do it. You know, when you really have to do something, right. you have to will it in. Right. But you can't just will something in that's never been accomplished by your system. True, true. So I hit, and my students that I talk to, I'll have them blue line. I never want to see it. I never want to see my partner trying to blue line something unless it's urgent. That's where I differ from the modern technicians. I want to find a way to win aggressively but safely. 
Right. And well, that's I'm not where, sure that if, I don't know sure, if it's possible anymore. Uh, well, but. I'm not sure that you're wrong in that regard. The, the, most coaches that I know are thinking high percentages, which to me um, brings me to the crux of this whole thing. And we've we got to wrap up here pretty soon. But I used to think, like what you said, that I want to make the court bigger. I want to make my opponent have to go the furthest distance to the ball. But what I noticed was the champions shoot the ball and they execute the shots, which puts more pressure on the opponent and takes away hope. And I first saw this when I was working with Michelle Gould on the USA team. There just wasn't any hope. She, she just flat rolled for the returns, like, like Kane does today. And then I got thinking, I backed up. A well-coached athlete is at a disadvantage. And I'm reminded of a discussion I got into with all these great Olympic coaches. We have an Olympic coaches meeting, we're on a bus. The best part of the Olympic coaches thing, they had all this stuff planned for us, but when you got to talk with Tom O'Brien, I think his name was Tom O'Brien, Greg Leganis' diving coach. Mm -hmm. When you got to talk with the greatest athletic minds of our century, and, and they all, we got talking, and the guy goes, hockey guy goes, you know, the greatest player that ever played hockey didn't go through any of our feeder programs. Wayne Gretzky learned to play on a pond by himself. And, wow. then, and then I got thinking about all the great racquetball players I've ever known. They weren't well coached. They, like yourself, they got on the court and they hit thousands and thousands of balls. They... And then someone came along and, and saw their game and helped them refine it maybe and taught them some new tricks. But I don't want any of my athletes to be well coached and I want them to create. I want them to be creative. I don't want them to be regimented. I don't want them to be afraid. I don't want them to be by some kind of a percentage book. And I definitely don't want to call serves for them. I want them to be able to I do call serves for some of my junior players so they learn how to put serves together. And I do help people when they need a serve. All right, let me make one point on this. Right now in football, they have extraordinarily talented quarterbacks with years and years of experience, and they have the call come in from some geek up in the uh, right. stands. Right. Okay. It's my opinion that what a quarterback thinks is the best play is what should be called, regardless of whether it's the best play. Because by his thought that it's the best play, it becomes the best play. Have, have you ever heard them talk on the sidelines? No. Okay. The Bradys, the Mannings, the people of that caliber, and in fact, all of them. Now, at the high school level, does I, what really set me off on racquetball was when I went back and coached high school football and started looking at the offensive schemes. Today's high school quarterback in almost every system is using the same terminology the pros use. The, the backs are called the same, everything is the same. So they know how to read defenses. So they're reading what used to be a skill that you would not even learn in college in the 70s. You only learned it in pros. All, the average high school quarterback today can go to the line of scrimmage and audible. About 30% of the plays are at the line in a number. So the, the quarterback's calling them. In the pros, the quarter, a, a play might be sent down, but it's an option play, and they're reading the patterns. Almost every one of them have a pattern. Now, there might be a set play that they might run that they've worked on against a defense in a situation. But in, in, my, in the old days, when I played, you had a set play. Uh, like a 33 would be the three back would run a, a three pattern, which was an out. Well, today, that, that play is called a Z33 option, let's say. Mm -hmm. So you've got... So you've got the option of running a three or a three and up, depending on if he presses you. So the quarterback is actually creating within that system. And there's a lot of collaboration. If you notice on the sideline, quarterback's always over there looking at the pictures with the, with the coach because they're going over what they call. They do exactly 
what I want my athletes to do. We're in St. Louis. Kane calls timeout, tight match. I go down. He says, what serve? And I always hate it when somebody says, what serve? Because, you know, you're either a genius or you're an idiot, right? So I said, I think lob right. Okay. I go back up. And now St. Louis, it's a long trip. you got to go down the hall and run all the way up. I can just get to my seat. And he, he hits the serve, drive serve left, ace. Guy in the crowd goes, great call, coach. That's perfect. <laughs> and, and Kane and I laughed about that. He, he looks back at me and goes like this. And I'm laughing because we, we have an understanding, and I do with any athlete. I never say, I say, what do you think? So if they either say, what serve? What do you think of? Eh, you know how it is. Sometimes you don't feel comfortable hitting it. And so what do you think about? And, and Chris, but I remember one crazy, I get into this match. Just one match in particular sticks to me, and I don't want to say the athlete's name publicly. But this athlete wins the first game big. Second game is up big. The other athlete comes back. And my athlete, all right, I Time out. What serve? Lob down the wall, wide open. Okay. Go out. Before I can even sit down, she. she oh, I said she. <laughs> Oops. Puts the ball in play. I didn't say, take your time with the serve. Do I have to say, take your time with the serve? Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I have to say, take your time with the serve. Okay. Now, on one hand, you go, wow, that's a pro athlete. Why wouldn't they take their time with a serve? But on the other hand, that's the coach's job. You know? It's like with Jim Fossil, the 49ers, that year that they snapped the ball on the wrong count or something, and he said, well, it, it, we, pra you know, we don't practice that, but he should know. Stop. You don't practice it, your fault. Right? Well, I agree. And uh, the, the service issue and all the things, I've really enjoyed kicking it around with you. And uh, uh, it's great to have somebody with your coaching skills go through these with me. Well, it, we could spend another eight hours on this, I'm sure. But uh, we can't stop here. We've got to talk more about all this stuff. It's great. What I love about talking with you and Dr. Bud and all the, all the people that played at the high level you guys did is you've got a perspective out of the box from, from the era. And to me, to improve as an athlete, a player, a coach, you have to step back out of the box and be careful you don't end up so far in the forest you can't see the trees, you know. And I, I think your next inter interview should be with Hogan and ask him, all of the questions about how he developed his game because he was the natural. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Thanks. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.